Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of the Better Off Podcast. Today, we are talking about TARP. What happened with that plan to rescue the big banks? Was it fairly implemented? We have a guest who has inside information about what went down with TARP. If any company runs out of capital, runs out of equity, then their liabilities are more than their um, assets and they go bankrupt. And that was the fear that was really gripping Washington and the world was that these banks simply were undercapitalized. They had borrowed too much money. They had taken too much losses and these wild bets that they've made on mortgages and housing. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. This is the final interview that we are airing in honor of the 10-year anniversary of the financial crisis. Uh, We had Gretchen Morganson from The Wall Street Journal, previously of The New York Times. We had Adam Tews, whose book Crashed is just an incredible analysis of the whole financial crisis. He's a historian at Columbia University, so it's a very big picture view. And let's be honest, you're not reading a 600-page book. I did it for you. So listen to that. Today, we've got a, a really interesting guest. His name is Neil Borofsky. His book, way back when, which is already about five years old, was called Bailout, How Washington Abandoned Main Street While Rescuing Wall Street. And the reason why Neil Borofsky is the perfect person to interview about this is because he was the guy who was hired to oversee the troubled asset plan, the TARP. And oddly enough, this Saturday... The 29th of September is the anniversary of when the House of Representatives rejected the legislation submitted by the Treasury Department requesting authority to purchase troubled assets from financial institutions. Obviously, we know that just days later, Congress passed and President Bush signed into law Uh, The Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, it did establish the $700 billion Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, but TARP turned into something very different. And that's what you're going to hear about from our guest, Neil Borofsky. Here's our interview with Neil. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Neil Borofsky, welcome to the program. I'm very excited to have you in the studio. It's very exciting to be here. Thank you. Uh, We start our program every single interview. You ready? Mm -hmm. What is the best financial or career decision you've ever made? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think from a career decision, it was when I got the call back in 2008 uh, in the midst of the financial crisis um, when I was asked whether I would be willing to apply for this crazy job that had been created as part of the bank bailout, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, to be uh, the first special inspector general for that program. Let's go back a little bit in time. So you were a prosecutor, right? Yes. And so you were trained as a lawyer. You graduated from law school. What was your first job out of law school? Uh, I was an associate at a big law firm uh, here in New York City, Mm -hmm. Uh, basically one of those big, giant, sprawling corporate law firms where I did actually a lot of work in music licensing. Oh, really? Yeah, but I I realized that what I really wanted to do, like why I went to law school, was to be a federal prosecutor. That was sort of my, my goal, cops and robbers, that type of thing. And uh, when I realized that that my career path wasn't really headed in that direction, I ended up changing jobs pretty quickly to go to a law firm that did uh, criminal law defense, and that was a feeder firm into the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York and Manhattan with the idea that I'd do my time, work for, for, work for those guys. Uh, they would support an application. And ultimately, in 2000, I, I, started, I got my dream job. And so that was with Morvillo. That's where you were, right? Yes, Previously. Exactly. Okay. So what happens when you become a prosecutor? Like, you don't know... You you were in a litigation firm, right? So you now know how a case works. But what happens when you go and work as a federal prosecutor? What, who trains you? How do you know what to do? Well, one of the nice things about going to an office like the Southern District of New York, the U.S. Attorney's Office, is um, they kind of recognize that when you first come in, they're not giving you, for example, the investigation into Michael Cohen and and you know those things. So you start with smaller cases um, that are less complex, and it's very much on the job training, but with a lot of training. And so 
Now, look, these cases are incredibly important to the people who are involved, uh, obviously the defendant. Um, it is a life thing as well as to, to the victims. But they're, they're simpler, easier cases, so you sort of get the, the routine for it. And, you know, once you sort of get that confidence and that training, then you move on to the more complex cases. What was complicated that you started to work on that, that got your brain really moving? Well, I had a fun career. I always thought of myself as a white collar guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a lot of work defending white collar defendants when I was an associate at a law firm. Uh, but I actually fell in love with doing international narcotics trafficking cases. Um, the office had done was really a, uh, a first mover in dealing with drug kingpins in other countries, particularly in South America, Colombia. And I fell in love with doing those cases. They were so much more complex than I thought. Um, doing investigations in other countries, working with other foreign law enforcement as well as U.S. law enforcement, putting them together. And uh, that really became a passion of mine, um, which culminated ultimately in the indictment of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, 50 of the leaders of the so-called FARC. Um, in what was described at the time as the biggest drug case brought in U.S. history. So, wow. So it wasn't exactly the path that I anticipated, but uh, I really love that work. Now it's 2008. You're doing these complicated drug cases. Explain what happens when you get this call like, hey, Neil, come to my office. What is the actual time? Where, what, what, where were we? So it was, um, it was in October of 2008, shortly after the bill passed that authorized the bank bailout. And, and in addition to doing the drug cases, I did securities fraud prosecutions. I, I tried the, uh, the former executives of Refco, uh, the commodities mm -hmm. giant that, that collapsed. Uh, a couple years earlier, and then also had started a mortgage fraud group. And so, you know, as the financial crisis began, all this mortgage fraud became very apparent. Wait, so you were doing mortgage fraud when? Like back in 2007, like as the housing market tipped or later than that? We formed our group, I believe it was in March or April of 2008. So okay. just as, as the you know, as, as it was really becoming apparent that one of the drivers of this oncoming crisis um, was the fraud that underlied so many of these securities that ultimately blew up. And, and uh, So you and had some familiarity, crisis. at least, with like what was happening. Like, hey, this thing happened. You obviously are a student of, of the news as well. So you see the Bear Stearns thing blows up and you see that now things are escalating and you now come into the fall and we've had the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. We've had the AIG bailout. We've had uh, the bank holding company thing, and then we have TARP. Right. And when TARP was originally envisioned, as it was sold, was they were going to go out and buy residential mortgage-backed securities and the derivatives that were associated with them. So I had a background of prosecuting securities fraud and also investigating mortgage-related fraud. So I think that when my U.S. attorney called me up and asked me if I would be interested, he thought, okay, here's someone who's got expertise in both mortgage fraud and securities fraud. And the idea was to help protect this $700 billion bailout, which, again, at that point, was going to buy a whole bunch of mortgage-backed securities that would be prone to fraud. And who was the U.S. attorney at that time? It was Mike Garcia. He's now currently on the uh, New York State Court of Appeal, the highest court in New York. Okay, so... Mike calls you up, and you got a good relationship with him, and you're a seasoned guy. What do you think that call is about when you first get that call? Well, I remember at first I, I go up into his office, and he starts talking about this, the bailout, and I don't really know what he's exactly what he's talking about, but he starts describing that there's this new job that's going to be created in a bill called a special inspector general, and I didn't really know what that meant. I wasn't aware that the bill had that. And he sort of explained that it was partly going to be a police force, a sort of an FBI for the TARP, a law enforcement agency that would police the, the money and make sure that criminals wouldn't t try to take advantage of it, and if they did, to investigate them and bring them to justice. And then the flip side was an auditing function, sort of like uh, doing types of audits that GAO does, making sure that the Treasury Department was acting the way it was supposed to and that the banks and those participating you know, followed all the rules and compliance of the program. And as he's telling me this, I have no idea that he's actually talking about me getting the job. I thought he was thinking about taking the job because it sounded like an enormous, important job and moving to D.C. And so as he's, what I'm thinking about is, I don't really want to go and do this with him because I thought he was going to ask oh, me so to Oh, so you go. think, okay, I, he's going and maybe he wants me to come and be a deputy. Right. And I'm like, I don't want to move to Washington. I'm pretty happy here. I have my dream job. This is all I want. And then eventually he's, he says, Neil, White House is looking for someone, and um, you know, what do you think about the job? Wait, how does he get that call? Like Bush administration, someone knows someone who knows him. Like, how does it, or does it go out to all the U.S. attorneys? What? So I don't know entirely, but what I surmise is is that you know, the, this was going to be a presidentially appointed Senate confirmed position, and there are 
you know, people within the Department of Justice and within the White House who are alumni of, of the office, the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, including someone who's another name that's in the news a lot today, Bill Burke, who was a uh, um, deputy White House counsel and who was a, an alumni of the office. And so he reached out to Mike and saying, hey, do you know anyone there who might be uh-huh. filled this role? If we decide to go with a prosecutor type, do you know someone who's got this type of securities and mortgage fraud experience? And so Mike's reaction was, yeah, Borofsky, he, he, this is what he's been doing for, for recently, and he would be great. And so then I guess it goes to Washington, with, and I interviewed among with a bunch of other people. I don't know who they all are, uh, but interviewing at the White House and at the Treasury Department. Is that scary? It was more surreal. Like, I never thought I had a shot. I mean, I was an Obama contributing Democrat, um, you know, and this was now I'm interviewing for a job for a presidential appointment by George W. Bush, which just seemed insane. I have zero political connections, zero political ambition. And so it was kind of a lark, the whole thing. I I never really thought it was possible um, until all of a sudden, a few days after I interviewed, I got the call saying that we're going to. Uh, recommend to President Bush that you be nominated to be the Special Inspector General. And oh my I, God! And I remember I was uh, I was in Florida visiting with my my parents. It was my nephew's bar mitzvah that weekend, and I was at a diner, and I get this call. Um, the White House is calling, and I walked outside, took the call, went out, went back, and told my parents. And it was just sort of, again, it was just a, a very very surreal thing. I don't think I had any idea how high profile it would turn out to be, and how crazy the job would be. I, I really thought it would be a, a cops and robbers type yeah, of job. Right. Um, but of course, once I got to Washington and I realized that the Treasury Department wasn't going to be administering the bailout the way Congress intended um, to achieve a lot of the goals that Congress had put into the bill and how the money should be used, um, that it was going to be something else. Um, okay. So let's talk about it. The, the TARP, as it was originally conceived, as you said, we're going to buy up toxic assets from these big banks. We're going to take them off their balance sheets so they don't fail, right? Yes. Okay. What did it morph into? I think they quickly realized that that wasn't perhaps the most well thought out plan, uh, nor would it be quick enough because the crisis was quickening uh, very, very quickly in October, November. And they realized that the real problem was that these banks were going to fail because they didn't have enough equity. Um, they didn't have enough capital. So in other words, as these losses from their massive exposure they had to houses, right? You know, houses and then the the bonds that were made up of these houses and then the derivatives, which were bets on how these houses were, were, you know, how these mortgages on these houses were performing, um, that there's just these massive losses and this complete lack of confidence as to whether the banks had enough capital to avoid bankruptcy. Because, you know, of course, you know, Economics 101, if any company runs out of capital, runs out of equity, then their liabilities are more than their um, assets and they go bankrupt. And that was the fear that was really gripping Washington and the world was that these banks simply were undercapitalized. They had borrowed too much money. They had taken too much losses and these wild bets that they've made on mortgages and housing. And they realized that the United States government needed to take ownership uh, interest, put their own money in sort of investing in, in a certain type of stock, it was preferred shares of stock, in order to keep these, these these financial institutions from failing. And so it really turned a lot of it into just buying stock in these companies to keep them from failing. Do you think, in retrospect, the TARP part of it, was that the smartest way to address the problems? I think given... You know, it's sort of one of those 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 things. It's like when you get to the point where you were when they made that decision, it was the best decision. Now, obviously, had they planned out better, had they foresaw this when the first indications that there were a problem, there may have been better paths. But I actually think right now you had an equity problem, right? You had companies where the market was fearing that they were going bankrupt. And, and look, I mean, a lot of it, it was, you know, how do these institutions get so le- so much leverage? How do they end up borrowing so much money and having so little invested. I mean, you look at Apple. I mean, how long would Apple last if they had if they borrowed $50 for every dollar in 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 equity that they had? I mean, mm-hmm. they wouldn't last a, a week. But one of the reasons why these institutions were is there's this huge presumption that they would be bailed out eventually because they're so large and so interconnected and it was so understood that the failure of any one could trigger a cataclysm. And so what happened, I think, when Lehman was allowed to fail, when the decision was made by Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke and Timothy Geithner. um, Which was baloney. They were like, oh, no, we couldn't have bailed them out. But of course they could have. Of course they could have bailed them out. And and it's a very careful language that they use, but they were actively considering bailing them out. 
and they decided not to bail them out, to let them fail, to try to send a message to the market. Of course, the message that the market received was, oh my God, this presumption that we've had that these institutions will be bailed out is no longer valid, and pure panic, pure panic that that this this presumption that really was the underpinning of, of our financial system might not be true. And so, of course, within you know, within what twenty four hours, this was this was recognized. AIG was bailed out, um, which it had to be, and then they had to get this this money into into the system. And so, the reason why I think TARP was so effective is two parts. Right, first of all, it just put the money in. Right, I mean, and so you know, you don't go bankrupt if you have more capital. But second, it reaffirmed the message and the presumption: the United States government is not going to let these financial institutions to fail. We recognize that we. Maybe we screwed up uh, by letting Lehman fail, and we're not going to do it again. And whatever it takes, whether it's $700 billion of TARP funds or trillions of dollars of guarantees uh, and loans and liquidity functions, like we're, we're not going to let this happen. And I think that was sort of the beginning of, of turning around. Now, the way they did it, I think, was really, really violated um, what they were supposed to do and some of the goals that Congress had put forth for them. How so? Well, when Congress passed this bill, and you may recall... Um, it didn't go the first time. So they had to get it through Congress. And so they made some deals. And part of the deals is expressed in the bill itself of what its goals were going to be. Mm-hmm. And so there are really two primary goals that were went beyond just saving the banks for the sake of saving the banks. One was to restore lending, to get the economy going again. Because you know when financial institutions are all starting to collapse, they're not lending. And if you don't have any lending in an economy, the economy stops, right? We saw that in the Great Depression, and that's what contributed to the Great Recession. And so that was one big concern. And the second big concern was housing. And in order to get votes, you know, sort of a little bit of a history lesson here, but particularly the Congressional Black Caucus, right, which was, you know, Democrats who ultimately are the reason why this bill passed, you know, they weren't so concerned with saving Wall Street banks. They were served with this foreclosure crisis that was just devastating the communities. And they said, look, we'll go along with this, but you've got to do something. You've got to fix housing. You've got to help people who are struggling in foreclosure. And so the deal was, once you buy all these mortgage-backed securities and all these mortgages, which is, again, what they were originally going to do, you've got to fix them. You've got to modify them so people can afford to stay in their homes before you sell them back out into the market. And of course, Treasury said, sure, we'll do that. Of course, then they didn't buy any um, loans, so they didn't actually have to do that. But those were two of the two promises that were made, Mm. that it was not going to just help Wall Street, but it was going to help Main Street by restarting lending and helping people stay in their homes. And so when they put this money into the banks, Treasury Department, they had a tremendous amount of leverage. They could have said, okay, we're going to give you this money, but we're going to condition it on increased lending, or we're going to tie your dividend payment that you have to pay to us. We're going to do that based on whether or not your baseline lending increases or decreases. The amount you owe us will go up or down. They could have had some requirements to deal with foreclosure, but they didn't. They were just shoveling the money in to protect the banks at all, at all costs and totally ignored what they were supposed to do and required to do by, by law. In your mind, was that a purposeful oversight or just the blanks hitting the fan and we're just moving forward and we're super scared and we're just going to push the money over there? I think at first it was the latter, right? They were just scared and they didn't really care. Uh, honestly, about what the promises were made to Congress. And they certainly didn't care about struggling homeowners. Um, Mm. You know, part of it is, again, because of the panic at the time. And part of it was just a mindset. And and look, this was consistent across both administrations. So Mm -hmm. remember, this all started in the Bush administration. But very, very quickly, you know, by January, we were dealing with the Obama administration and went from Hank Paulson to Tim Geithner as the Secretary of Treasury But in many ways, none of this really changed. And when it came to struggling homeowners, there was a prevailing view within the Treasury Department that these were a bunch of deadbeats uh, who took out money loans that were irresponsible, that they shouldn't have taken out these mortgages, and they really weren't deserving of a government bailout. Which was, you know, sort of shocking because here totally. they were, right? That first wave of foreclosures was happening in 2007. That yep. wasn't the second order effect of 2008-9. It's so upsetting to hear that that was the mindset. I mean, I think ultimately it's almost the, the circles you run in, right? I think most of the people that we were dealing with at the Treasury Department just ran in circles where they didn't know people mm. who were foreclosed upon and sort of had this, this view that... They're just deadbeats. You know, oh, they took the money out because they wanted to have a pool and a, a second home. And 
And yeah, some of that happened. Yeah, of course. Was, but you know what? A lot of people were victims of very predatory practices. They took out loans that they didn't understand and they they could never repay. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were tricked. They were defrauded. And others just came on hard times. And, you know, putting aside whether anyone, quote unquote, deserved it, just the, the economic effect of helping these people, the, the amount of the, the return that you would have gotten by helping them versus not helping them and letting them fail, you know, and it's not just liberal, a liberal perspective. I remember Martin Feldstein, you know, about as conservative of, of an economist that possible, you know, made the case at the time that, you know, half of the TARP money, $350 billion, should have gone just to reducing principal on mortgages of mm. people suffering in the crisis. Not because it's a nice thing to do, but because of the follow-on impact for the economy. But there was just no appetite for that within the Treasury Department, and they really abandoned Main Street when it came to uh, that that mandate to help help struggling homeowners. So, in your book, which I reread, I was struck by something you said, and also something in the book that really it was tough to deal with. Geithner, who you encountered as sort of an obstructionist to what your role was as the special inspector general of TARP. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, some people are just not prone to being overseen, I think, and uh, and certainly to be second guessed um, or to have their, um, you know, their, their sort of omniscient, all knowing approach to be challenged. And I don't think Secretary Geithner ever really understood what the role of an inspector general was to be. Um, you know, a lot of times we would get these criticisms, well, you're a backseat driver, you're second guessing our, our things. And I sort of had to explain to him like, well, that's my job. Like, it's actually my job to be a backseat driver is to look at what you've done, to report on it and give you recommendations on how to fix it because we're all fallible. We all make mistakes. And in the heat of a crisis, mistakes are being made and you're making mistakes. And, you know, to the extent that you're listening to us, we can help you and informing us, we can help you avoid those mistakes at the time. But they weren't really all that keen on providing us real time information. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, our job is to go back and with these programs, which are ongoing running programs, to give you recommendations on how to fix them. And And did they take those recommendations? Some of them they did. Many of them they did not. Um, I think there was a real, real frustration towards transparency. You know, ultimately... The taxpayers were the ones who were funding this program. Right. They were the investors, if you if you will. And the investors have a right to know what's going on inside the program. And what we would hear repeatedly from Secretary Geithner and others was that people just couldn't understand it. It was all too complex. They weren't really interested. They would just make it political. And, you know, our response was, yeah, but they still have a right to try to understand. Right. And, you know, and there was such a thirst for understanding of what was going on. I mean, we were a little tiny federal agency that was just created, um, but there was such an interest. You know, it was one of the things I talked about in the, in the report. We, we set up a website and we threw our reports on the website, right? Because, you know, again, we had to be transparent. And not too far in, I just asked my communications person, like, is anyone actually going to our website? You know, we sort of did a little pool amongst ourselves, the senior leadership team, of how many hits we had. And I think I had the high water because I thought that we'd have 25,000 people maybe, maybe came to our website. And the number came out to be 50 million. People wanted to understand. And, you know, what's part of what we try to provide was that transparency. People wanted to know. Like, one of the first things I pushed for is, like, let's tell the American people what the banks are doing with their money. Right. Right. Let's let's tell them. Well, you know, and ultimately Treasury flat out refused to do it. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to go ask the banks what they're doing with the money. So you had the power to go into the big financial holding companies that were part of this program and be able to say, so tell me what you're doing with your money. And did they have to say, tell you what they were doing? Or could they be like, nah, we don't want to talk to you? Um, They didn't have to. So ultimately what we did is we sent these letters out, even though Tim Geithner and the Treasury Department told us that again, not exaggeration, that we were going to destroy the entire banking system as we knew it if we went, if we dared to go ask the banks, what are you doing with Barofsky, the Barofsky, you have got so much power. <laughs> yeah, I, right? am, I feel it coming out of you right now. But I will tell you, at the time when you hear that- and Yeah, it's scary. Are, I, thought, I remember going to my deputy. I'm like, are we going to destroy the entire banking system by asking them? And he just sort of laughed and used a number of expletives. Of course not. Like, we're just bringing, this is our job. We have to do this. And so, so, so we did- and there were some financial institutions that did not respond until maybe the day before. Um, and I think what we would do is we would remind them of what it would look like if, you know, of the hundred, a couple hundred institutions all responded and this one did not. And we identified that to Congress. 
perhaps the repercussions of that. So they didn't have to respond, um, but ultimately, I think we had a hundred percent response rate. And you know, it didn't destroy the entire economy, but it did bring that level of transparency. And of course, we found out that when you give money to a bunch of financial institutions with no strings attached and no incentives, they did just about everything with the money other than what was intended. In other words, they weren't lending it out. They weren't pushing it out uh, to help revive the economy. They weren't helping to keep homeowners in their home. They were paying themselves out. Um, They were buying other banks. They were paying off debt. Um, Again, all not saying that these are terrible things to do. Right, it's not illegal. But not consistent with with, with the program. What's also interesting to me is that I can totally get the 2008 reaction Right. I can get that the the Paulson, Bernanke, Bush administration, the the fire is literally smoldering and burning and and it is scary. And you make the best decision you can in real time in that moment. What became harder for me to understand was, you know, six, eight, nine months later, how the Obama administration went so soft on the banks and they are not altruistic bankers. Let me be honest. I'm sure you know a few in your in your time. No, they're the, and <laughs> nor should they be, right? I mean, they're yeah. profit. They're profit seeking enterprises. Right. This is this is capitalism. But when you have so much concentrated power and the demonstrated ability to wreck the entire economy, you can't just trust them. This is better off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Neil Borofsky in just a minute. You know, I think one of the big lessons of the financial crisis is that there were so many investors who were suffering such dire consequences of market gyrations. And sometimes they did some really dumb things to themselves. These are, in my mind, some of the average ways that people tend to react to extreme circumstances. You know, they freak out, they sell, they do this. It's like predictable, right? But you're not the average investor. So this time around, now that we're 10 years out from the financial crisis, why settle for the same old average investing? Now there's a smarter way to manage your money, Betterment. Betterment is an online financial advisor for those people who refuse to settle for average, demand better. Of course, investing always involves risk. But here's something cool. Better Off listeners can get up to one year managed free by visiting Betterment.com slash Better Off. That's Betterment.com slash Better Off. Okay, now back to our interview with Neil Borofsky. So talk a little bit more as time progressed. You, you, you demand more transparency. Talk a little bit about working with Congress and what that was like. So I am, maybe because I'm a masochist, but there's a few things I enjoyed more about my job than than our interactions with Congress. Really? Um, I testified, I think, 25 times uh, between the House, different House and Senate committees. And I mean, it really was the full range of what one would expect. I mean, there were political grandstanding members of Congress who didn't understand anything that we were doing uh, and were just looking for the cheap headlines. But there was also a lot of really hardworking staffers and members of Congress who deeply, deeply cared about these issues and were successful. And I think to the extent that we had success in improving some of these programs and perhaps our bigger successes is preventing worse things. I mean, really potential programs that were just been riddled with with fraud and huge losses. It was because of Congress and the pressure that Congress put on the Treasury Department and the White House. That's the reason why we were able to to do what we we did. And, you know, I found it frustrating and beguiling and wonderful, uh, the whole all those interactions, because they're such characters. I mean, I think, you know, you put aside the political leanings and what you think, but spending a half an hour with Barney Frank or Daryl Issa or Chuck Grassley, I mean, these are fascinating human beings. Um, so, I mean, we did have support on, on both sides of the aisle. How long were you at in this role of Sig A little bit under two and a half years. I got there in, I was confirmed in December of 2008, and I left uh, March 31st, 2011. Why did you leave? It was time to go. You were uh, tired. I was tired. I was, um, I felt myself becoming part of the Washington establishment. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the reason why I was able to be effective is that I didn't care. Like, this was not the job that defined me. I was a federal prosecutor at heart. And I felt myself 
just being more and more ensnared in the pettiness and the everyday um, ego and all of the things of Washington. And I thought I was becoming much less effective. Um, I think I'd become such a I'd be very controversial uh, figure in Washington. You seem such a nice guy. And yes, you were very controversial. People really threw you under the bus, man. Yeah, I think I, I, I and it started to impact my ability to be effective. Um, mm. The amount of sort of lies that were being spread and starting to take hold within the media. And so it, so part of it was just, I will wonder if I could truly still be effective at the job. And the other part was, it's kind of a, over. Like, I mean. The, yeah. So what happens to TARP? You left and then what happened? So it's actually, so my agency is still, believe it or not, alive and, and, and well. Um, the Office of the Special Inspector General. Um, there's still some of these programs are still winding down. What's interesting is what what the agency has become today is much more of a law enforcement agency hmm. and has had really tremendous successes and and so it sort of lives on in 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 that aspect um, the bailout itself there is some of the housing programs very ineffective housing program unfortunately hamp, still, blah, hamp, blah, 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 all yeah, that. The hamp and making they're still running off but but really by March 2011 it was done you, you know the, what I could do I think what, what the contributions I can make were, were somewhat limited at that point. So as you look back, it's a decade since that time. What, in your mind, scares you about this environment? Well, it's not so much scares. I, this was all very predictable, unfortunately. I mean, this is the cycle that we go through. And, and the cycle, I mean, is the cycle of boom, bust, and bailout, which has marked our financial history of this country for centuries, really. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity was there to break up the big financial institutions, to, to take the statement that no longer are we going to tolerate an economy where any single institution is so big and so powerful and so interconnected that its failure would threaten our entire financial system. And because, you know, one of the things that arose out of the bailouts is that you had these big, too big to fail institutions, which is truly what they were, and we made them bigger. Right. Right. We, we encouraged them to gobble up their competitors. And so there's a real opportunity there. To, to break them up. Right? So and when you say break up, would you say like a repeal of Glass-Steagall so that investment banking and, and commercial banking, you know, is broken up or size wise or complexity wise? What are you thinking about? Like, what does a breakup mean? So I'm I'm agnostic. I mean, honestly, amongst the different uh, the, the different potential solutions, I think, you know, bringing back Glass-Steagall and separating commercial um you know, from investment bank would be effective. I think, you know, one of the ideas was just increasing um, the capital requirements based on the size of the bank. So mm -hmm. if you get to be a certain size, you have to have, you know, ever scaling up uh, capital requirements, which would essentially discourage institutions from becoming too big mm -hmm. uh, or size caps. Right. I mean, that was sort of another legislative possibility that had a lot of support. And, and you know, it was very much on the table. Politically, the votes were there for that type of breakup. And Senators Brown and Senators Ted Kaufman, again, I talked about Sherrod Brown, I forgot Senator Kaufman, who, again, who just had mastery of these issues uh, from Delaware, you know, they had a bill that had a lot of support. And Geithner and Summers in the White House um, killed support for that bill. And, you know, later, one of them sort of bragged to, I think it was New York Magazine, yeah, Brown Kaufman would have passed if we supported it, but we didn't. We killed it and it didn't go. So rather than having a permanent solution, Dodd-Frank came along. And look, Dodd-Frank did a lot of positive things, for sure. And one of the reasons we've had the stability we've had is Dodd-Frank has contributed to that. It brought higher capital levels. It restricted uh, proprietary trading, where the banks were basically taking our taxpayer-backed money and making these huge speculative bets in order to reap in the profits and bonuses. And so it did some good things. But it had some very, very key flaws. And I think chief among them was... It put this enormous amount of trust and faith in the regulators themselves to carefully manage these institutions. Now, there were two problems with that, which we talked about in my book and we talked about at the time. One, they've never been able to do that, regulators. And this is when the institutions were smaller and less complex than what we made them after the crisis. And second, it presumes that you have regulators that have a consistent worldview and political view as those at the time that Dodd-Frank was passed. In other words on a Democratic administration that had just been through a giant bailout and was sort of aware of these issues and interested in them. And it was very, very, very predictable. And we predicted it and said, like, look, this is all fine and good, but you still have institutions, the failure of any one of which will bring down the entire economy. So you're going to bail them out. 
second elections. Like they change. And whatever your mindset is today, who knows who the next president's going to be and who the next treasury secretary is going to be. And the idea that right now we have in Washington regulators walking in lockstep with members of Congress who want to reduce capital levels. I mean, Dodd-Frank did not bring capital levels up to a, a sufficient amount to ensure the safety of our system. They improved them. They made it safer, but not safe. And now there's this push to cut capital levels, which to be very, very clear, that is what will help contribute to the next financial crisis. If banks don't have sufficient buffers to absorb losses, they will go bankrupt and we will be bailing them out again. The idea that we need to kickstart or increase the profitability of the banks or make them more competitive is absurd. I mean, it's actually insane, right? If the definition of insanity is repeating the same mistakes and expecting a different result, this is truly insanity that we're going to go back to a, a system which led to the mere ruination of our, our country and to go back to it. Why? So they can get even more higher record profits based on our taxpayer guarantees and backup? I mean, that's a very, very long answer to your I question like that one, about though. why I'm scared. <sighs> It's not even scare, though. It's, it's, it's almost it's a certainty. We stay down this path. It's going to happen again, and it's going to be worse this time right. because they're bigger and scarier. There's a, a couple of studies that came out just a couple of days ago, um, which I think were fascinating. One is from the, the Fed in San Francisco um, saying that the economic costs of the last financial crisis was 22 or $23 trillion as far as lost GDP. It's mind-numbing. You know, and it's sort of interesting because you know, when we did a calculation of, of the total amount of all-in that the government was for, for about, it was right around 22 or $23 trillion. Mm. Um, And at the times, we were, we were mocked and ridiculed by Treasury and, some, and, and by Wall Street by throwing that number out. And here we are 10 years later. And that's actually what our economy has lost. Um, mm. So you have that on the one hand. And then you have Government Accountability Office, con- Congress's auditing arm, just came out with a study that said that, that Dodd Frank had really no impact, no negative impact at all on, on lending or you know on, on on the banks. And then you have the third thing, which is again the record setting profits of these financial institutions. And I don't know how anyone looks at those data points and says, Wow, we really need to uh, deregulate these institutions yeah, further. Yeah, exactly. It's it was, insanity. It is insanity. All right, before we let you go, first of all, let me ask you a few questions. One, personally after being through this. Did you learn any larger lessons after living through the crisis in real time, like just in your own personal financial life? Oh, that's interesting. My own financial life. Well, I'm not long residential mortgage-backed securities. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, I, happily, I you know, I have a little bit more money than I did back then since I've been out of government for for, for, for a few years. Uh, so I think I, I'm, I think I'm probably extraordinarily conservative uh, with my, you know, the, the amount of money... You know, I don't have any great riches, but uh, with my money, I think I'm, I think I'm, I'm very, very conservative um, with that personally. But I think the other thing is that I think one of the great tragedies that's happening right now, one of the things I learned from my time in Washington is that notwithstanding the trouble I had with some of the most senior leaders, um, the men and women who serve this country and our federal government are remarkably talented, dedicated, smart people. And you know, this sort of vilification of the federal government employee, whether it's in law enforcement. And, you know, I spent most of my time in law enforcement and spent so much time working with the FBI. And I hired a bunch, some former FBI agents to become my, my federal law enforcement agents and the Department of Justice, in which I've spent so much of my career. And, I mean, these are really, really good people. These are patriots who don't make a lot of money, who do it for the right thing. And seeing the current political environment, these people vilified with motives ascribed to them, it just, it's just not exist. I think it's it's a, it's a little bit heartbreaking. I think I mm. I knew that from New York, being a, a federal prosecutor in New York, but going to Washington in the heart of it, and getting to work with so many different law enforcement agencies and so many different parts of the Department of Justice, um, it was really one of the, the great joys and wonderful experiences. We asked at the beginning of the program your best financial decision, and you said taking this job actually, this hard job. What was the worst financial decision you ever made? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, I've been so, you know, I've never had money before I got out of government. <laughs> so I didn't really make financial decisions and everything I do is is, is, is so conservative. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll tell you, I will tell you the worst financial decision. Okay, I now made. I knew it. I could just rack your brain. It took me a second, uh, although I fixed it very good. In high school, 
Yeah. Um, I was looking for a summer job, and I always had different jobs, uh, you know, in, in high school. But um, at this point, we we're living in Boca Raton, Florida. This is this is. A, I'm going to disclose a fact here that, that I don't think I've ever disclosed publicly before. And so I was looking at the one ads to try to get, and I went to, and this is Boca Raton, right? This is 1988, 87. It's like the heart of fraud in Boca Raton, Florida. And I answered a uh, an ad for some investing something, right? I was like, oh, go. And I went, and I, for four hours, I cold called investors for what I realized, even in my like 17 year old or 18 year old brain, was a massive securities fraud. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a, so I quit after four hours, which was a good decision. That's good for at least a half a day. That was a that was a bad bad decision, and I got a check for the four hours, and it bounced. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Okay, wait a second. So your four hours, you did not get paid, and yet a federal prosecutor was born of that experience. Exactly. Exactly. Neil Borowski, thank you so much for joining us. It has truly been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much to Neil Borofsky. If you'd like to buy his book, we'll have a link to it in our show notes. Don't forget that we have new episodes of Better Off every single Tuesday and Thursday. If you'd like to get on the air with us, just send us an email. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talaricio is now the engaged executive producer of Better Off. We are distributed by Cadence 13 and we're sponsored by Betterment. See you next week.